Echoes from the Eons, Episode 2, Australia's Shadows, produced by the National Dinosaur Museum, Canberra. Australia is famous for its unique and uncanny wildlife, its diverse and distinct environments, and its physical separation from the rest of the world. That tyranny of distance, with all the problems it presents, is in many ways a kind of blessing in that we are presented with a rare window into the past as unseen in many other places. It is a landmass that experiences considerable change and movement early, but today maintains some of the most noticeable markers of those earlier times. Even when still connected to the supercontinent Gondwana, the landmass that would become Australia was remote and difficult to access, and dinosaurs or other terrestrial animals from further north were slow to arrive. Although the fossil record here may be limited in certain areas, for example the particular scarcity of dinosaur bones, those fossils that are present still speak volumes. In addition to megafauna, dinosaur, diverse marine and plant life fossils from later eras, Australia enjoys some of the oldest rock formations in the world. It is easy to think of the ground as consistent, that soil and rock are all much the same, especially at the surface level that we are used to. This couldn't be further from the truth. The Western Plateau makes up 60% of the Australian landmass and can be dated between 500 million to 3 billion years old well over 200 million years before the first dinosaurs were even close to crawling out of their shells. While other regions may have comparatively newer formations, for the most part, this formidable age is a consistent theme across the entire country. It has a flow-on effect on many things that can be easily overlooked, from the kinds of farming and agriculture, or the sort of mining and industrial opportunities available to us, to the type and quality of the fossils that we are able to find. The way that the Australian continent has formed dictates the way that excavation, study and research is carried out. The early colonial naturalists began with coastal surveys in the 1800s. These produced largely invertebrate and plant fossils. Vertebrates weren't discovered until the late 19th century when these surveys were moved further inland. The discovery of gold provided the first real economic incentive to investigate the environmental potential of the landscape, opening the door at the same time for the foundation of paleontological work. Likewise, the history of opal mining is tied up with the discoveries of fossil-rich formations, and many fossils have been found opalized. One such example is the earliest monotreme fossil, a jaw fragment of 100 million years belonging to a creature named Steropodon glamani, an ancestor of the platypus. Chance, too, has its place, with graziers and farmers stumbling across oversized bones in their fields. In 1999, one such chance find produced the femur of a titanosaur, potentially up to 18 metres long, leading, in turn, to the discovery of other remains nearby in the Winton area. The first museums in Australia were established in the late 1800s, beginning with the Australian Museum in Sydney, and soon after, in the beginnings of the 20th century, universities began to train students for related naturalist studies. This was the true beginning of Australian paleontology being carried out by Australian scientists. Until this point, it was other foreign experts who carried out the process of describing and collating the fossils taken from on-site in Australia back in Europe. It was the English Sir Richard Owen, the man responsible for coining the term dinosaur, who described much of these new fossils, found in both Australia and in New Zealand, being by far the most prolific of these foreigners. One of Australia's first homegrown naturalists, Edmund Charles Hobson, had studied under Owen himself, and cooperation with international institutions and scholars remained important as studies progressed. This global interaction, sharing and exchanging of ideas, has blossomed with the improved technology of our modern times, and continues to be a core asset to all kinds of academic progress. Hobson died young, aged 34, but he had not been alone in his passion for natural history. His wife Margaret had also been a keen naturalist and a prolific sketcher, although unfortunately very few of her sketches survived in lithographic final plates. In addition to her artistic contributions, Margaret Hobson was also responsible for discovering the first trilobite in the Greater Melbourne District. Interest in Australian paleontology would only grow from here, seeing considerable expansion in the 50s, with the greatest activity surrounding fossilised fish and mammals. It was during this period of growth that enough samples were accumulated that it became possible to start to form summaries and theories about the wider implications of the subject matter found, also proving to be a great help geologically. There are certain regions that provide better or more useful formations than others. Some states are abundant in fossils, 
and others have comparatively very few. In Western Australia, some key places of interest include the Dampier Peninsula, famous for its dinosaur trackways. The fragile 375 to 350 million year old sediment deposits of the Bungal Bungal Ranges and the Gogo Formation in the Kimberleys, an exceptionally well preserved Devonian reef community. The Gogo Formation, discovered in the 40s, is an area of great significance. A location of such valuable resources is referred to as a Lagerstadt, from the German Lager, storage or lair, and Start, place and includes other exemplary sites such as the Burgess Shale, Canada, the Green River Formation, United States, Hunsruck Slates, Germany, and the Yishan Formation, China. The time represented by these sites, and the type of fossils within, are different from one another, helping to build a more cohesive global picture, and are separated into two main types, Concentrat Lagerstaten, Concentration Lagerstaten, which are deposits of large quantities of disarticulated organic hard parts, such as a bone bed, and Conservatat Lagerstaten, Conservation Lagerstaten, which are deposits known for the exceptional quality of preservation of the fossilised elements. The Gogo Formation is also the main location of interest for one of Australia's most notable contemporary paleontologists. Professor John Long of Flinders University has spent the last three decades investigating Devonian fish from that region, resulting in, among other things, important developments in understanding the evolution of sexual reproduction. He has also been a powerful force in bridging the gap between academic and popular science. Long is the author of over 30 books covering both technical and non-fiction books for adults and fiction or children's books. The Northern Territory is less densely populated than the other states and hasn't experienced quite as much activity. It is not without significance, however. The Amadeus Basin, again an area involved with prospective mining opportunities, contains the Horn Valley with siltstone of Ordovician times. In addition to other early life forms such as trilobites, the Horn Valley siltstone has revealed eight new species of lesser known creatures like conodonts. Conodonts have been found across the country, but the first Australian specimens were also found in the Northern Territory, in the more southerly Waterhouse Basin. Distantly related to the modern hagfish, conodonts were a mysterious group that existed from the late Cambrian to the late Triassic, spanning an incredible 300 million years, making them highly successful marine organisms. Exceptionally small animals, they are referred to as microfossils, often being preserved as minute components of 0.3 mm to 3 mm long, and are composed of calcium phosphate, similar to the teeth and bones of vertebrates. They were difficult to place at first, with differing schools of thought on whether they were types of worm, mollusk, or even plant, finally being classified as a kind of jawless fish. Due to their abundance, wide distribution, and highly diversified morphology, they are an important tool in dating and correlating Paleozoic and Mesozoic rocks, both locally and globally. Conodonts function as boundary markers between many systems and stages. To provide an example of this using the Ordovician system, there are around 30 biozones definable by conodonts and graptolites that the system can be divided into, each of which has a time span of less than 2 million years. Currently, there is no alternative dating method available that can produce a higher degree of resolution. An important site in Victoria is the Wonthagi Formation in the southeast, which has revealed half a dozen types of ornithischians, or bird hip dinosaurs, most notably the Qantasaurus in 1996. It is known only from jaw fragments, which suggests a shorter, stubbier face than related species. The name will sound familiar to most Australians, as it was taken from the airline Qantas. The name was awarded in recognition of the company sponsoring exhibitions overseas and transporting the Great Russian Dinosaurs exhibit around the country during the early 90s. While there are annual expeditions on the Victorian coast as part of the Dinosaur Dreaming program, there are some environmental setbacks. While the continents Australia and Antarctica were still connected, the area would have been a lush forest valley, accompanied by a long chain of volcanoes along the entire eastern side. This landscape is of course no longer evident and the only places the fossilised evidence of this former environment can be accessed is along the coast of what has since become southern Victoria. A second issue has been that although since the 80s there have been lots of fossils discovered on both sides of the coast, the vast majority of these have been isolated bits and pieces. The Burrinjuk area is one of the interesting locations in New South Wales, where the almost five kilometre thick Devonian sedimentary sequence reflects some extreme environmental changes. It is significant for producing the oldest known coral reef assemblage in the world. 
In the 1940s, five key fossil fish specimens from the region were used in London to develop the acetic acid technique for extracting bone from calcareous rock. This is now a standard laboratory practice. Much of the material is stored between the British Museum in London and the Australian National University in Canberra, with issues of heritage, repatriation and protection surrounding the two. There are many important locations in Queensland. One of these, the Alara Formation, is best known for producing the Richmond plesiosaur, discovered in the 90s. The Richmond plesiosaur, over four metres long, is the most complete of its kind in Australia. The plesiosaur was likely quite old at the time of death, as it was found to be exhibiting signs of arthritis in its neck and thorax. Plesiosaur is a broad term, much like shark, and there are many different species within that umbrella. The largest known to be swimming in the Cretaceous seas of what would one day become Queensland was the Cronosaurus queenslandicus, a huge creature, 10 metres in length with 20 centimetre long teeth. Other interesting sites are the Lark Quarry Track, discovered by Opal Prospectors in 1962, Eramanga, home to some of Australia's largest dinosaurs, as well as pterosaurs, which are exceedingly rare in this country, and Winton, one of the most active sites in contemporary Australian paleontology. Winton is a small town, famous for its boulder opals, proximity to important late Cretaceous deposits, and, unexpectedly, for being the home of celebrated poet Banjo Patterson, his poetry inspiring many of the nicknames given to the dinosaurs uncovered in that area. The Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum, about 24 kilometres east of Winton, is the body that facilitates the digs, research and maintenance of the area's paleontological assets. The museum functions a little different to others. While it offers tours, exhibitions and publications like most regular institutions, it is also a non-profit organisation that provides paying volunteers with the opportunity to participate in both the excavation of dinosaurs and the preparation of their bones. This is one of the rare chances a layperson has to get to know the extremely time-intensive processes behind fossil preparation and storage. This includes all stages, from fitting the fiddly plaster jacket on site to protect the bone during transportation, to the laborious process of removing the auxiliary rock with a precise compressed air gun, known as an air scribe, and sealing the final product in a protective resin acetone solution. The prepared bones are then puzzled out to try and identify what they are from and how they fit together, before being stored safely for formal description at a later point. While its fame comes primarily from its dinosaurs, the area has also revealed lungfish, turtles, cladocyclus, a bony fish, a pterosaur, insects including beetles and dragonflies, and one of the most complete crocodilian fossils known, the Isisfordia duncani. The two main types of dinosaur that Winton is known for are sauropods, long-necked dinosaurs, and theropods, think T-Rex shaped. Of the former, Diamantinosaurus is the most notable, being one of the best preserved skeletons in Australia. Standing three metres tall to the hip and about 15 or 16 metres head to tail, this sauropod skeleton is more robust than other examples of a similar size and shape, suggesting it would be a much heavier animal. There is some evidence of its sporting protective armouring, which could help account for this added weight. In the Winton tradition, she was nicknamed Matilda when first discovered, and she was found alongside one of the most exciting Australian dinosaurs, the theropod Australovenator wintonensis. Fondly referred to as Banjo, the horse-sized Megaraptor stands 1.6 metres tall at the tail and is nearly 6 metres long. The carnivore would have been agile and fast, but likely would have stalked its prey. It possessed three powerful claws on each hand, with the first digit of each being exceptionally long, and had an unusually high degree of flexibility in its arms. Banjo remains the most complete predatory dinosaur in Australia to date. Dinosaurs have a certain amount of glamour that often takes up discussion on paleontology. They are, however, only a small portion of the fossil record, particularly in Australia. The environment around them, before and after them, is equally fascinating, and in many ways more important. Just as it is easy to consider the soil stagnant, or consistent in time, it can be easy to forget that the plant life of each passing age has changed just as dramatically as the animals that lived beside them. As with vertebrate fossils, though, there are certain time periods that are less likely to produce fossilised evidence. Even in Western Australia, where the rock is truly ancient, the plant record can be frustratingly scanty. The prevalence of Triassic, Jurassic and earlier specimens is low, but not absent. From the Silurian period, found in Victoria, there is evidence of certain types of lycophyte, a plant similar to a fern, but with unique leaves, and these are some of the oldest terrestrial plants in the fossil record. 
As a group, modern lycophytes are fairly minor, but they were much more diverse in the past. They are lacking in flowers, seeds or wood, and reproduce using spores. During the Carboniferous period, around 359 to 299 million years ago, they were some of the largest plants on Earth, and contributed to vast coal-forming swamps in the Northern Hemisphere. The Western Australian record from the Cretaceous is a little more healthy, and the state has an abundance of non-deciduous jinkophytes, an early precursor to the modern jinko tree, large-leaf benetitale, an important Mesozoic group of seed fern now extinct, ferns and auricarian conifers, which all point to a relatively mild climate. Contrasted, for example, with Victoria in the early Cretaceous, which included seed ferns and deciduous jinkos reflecting a cooler climate. Further east, in the Blue Mountains, a rare piece of Cretaceous plant history is not just found preserved in stone, but endures as a living fossil. Discovered in 1994, the Wollomai pine is one of the oldest types of tree on Earth. With less than 100 mature adults known to be in the wild, this conifer, with its dark foliage, bubbly bark and multiple trunks, can grow up to 40 metres tall. The pine never evolved to shed leaves, and instead drops entire branches when the leaves become too old. Found in only one tiny area, it is the centre of extensive conservation and research efforts, helping to put the Greater Blue Mountains on the heritage list in 2000. The Wollomai is vulnerable, not just because it exists in a minute pocket of forest, but because it also shows no genetic variation. DNA analysis has shown that there is no discernible variation between the trees, although it is unclear if they are all clones, potentially spreading by underground root suckering, or if they have managed to successfully reproduce despite a highly restricted genetic pool to draw on. Either way, this extreme similarity leaves them at particular risk of infection or disease, and the actual Wollomai zone is now inaccessible to bushwalkers and visitors. The work of paleontology in Australia is far from complete. Every year new discoveries are made, slowly colouring the picture of our ancient landscape. The relationship between each extinct creature, the environment and the broader international connection continues to be an area of constant development and interest. The National Dinosaur Museum hopes you've enjoyed this episode of Echoes from the Eons, supported by the ACT government through the Where You Are Festival 2020, produced by Events ACT. This episode has been written by the National Dinosaur Museum, with thanks to Nicole O'Donnell and Mitchell Seymour, and has been voiced by Samantha Chester. Check out our website or follow us on Facebook for more great content, or better yet, come visit us at the museum.